Excellent. Good morning, everyone, and it's great to have you all here with us. I am Dr. Laura Bristol, Program Manager for Human Resource Development, and I want to take this opportunity on behalf of our collaborating partners, the UNESCO Regional uh, Cluster Office with Responsibility, that a regional education group for the Latin American and Caribbean region, the UNESCO Kingston Office, the UNESCO Santiago Office, and of course, the CARICOM Secretariat. Welcome to the first of our Caribbean webinar series entitled Leaving No One Behind in Times of COVID, the COVID-19 Pandemic. This session is one of many sessions that we will put on in collaboration with our development partners to support our member states with their responses to COVID-19. I won't take the time to, to rehearse the statistics we all are aware of those statistics and our colleague, Dr. Fariel Khan, she will share some of that with us when she does the introduction. But I want to point out and to remind and to take this opportunity that in light of the public health crisis that we are dealing with, education as a sector, which is one of the most complex sectors to respond to, is being forced now to ask and confront questions around the sustainability of educational provision, the continuity of learning in this context, and of course, doing so while giving significant consideration to questions of safety, not just in terms of social distancing, but given that we are using all of us a lot more of the online technology platforms, we are now beginning to confront questions of safety in online learning. So our panelists here are the first of many of our regional experts that you will meet. And I just want to take an opportunity to introduce them to you. We have Dr. Fariel Khan. She is the educational specialist of the UNESCO Kingston office. Fariel, give them a little wave. Good, and I'm going in order on my screen here. Dr. Freddie James, a lecturer at the University of the West Indies School of Education. Mr. Mark Light, the president of the Guyana Teachers Union. Mr. Peter Weller, a te he is one of our representatives from the Teacher Task Force, the UNESCO Teacher Task Force. Dr. Carlos Vargas, UNESCO Santiago Office and an Educational Specialist. And Dr. Roderick Broder, Deputy Chief Education Officer from Barbados. So I will now hand over with that and say our deepest thanks to you. This is a forum that is being recorded and will be available to you all uh, on the UNESCO website. I will also indicate that where questions are coming up, we are asking that you put all questions in the Q&A section, that icon at the bottom of your screen, so that we can ensure that we address your questions and you leave the chat for other matters and general information as we manage the logistics of the meeting. Our participants are going to be given, with the exception of Dr. Khan, they will be given um, an amount of seven to nine minutes to do their presentations. And then I'm asking them to keep on time because we want to have more space for conversation. So Dr. Khan, you have five minutes and over to you. Good morning, everyone. It is a very warm welcome from uh, UNESCO Kingston office. It really is a pleasure for me to be here with you today and uh, to uh, launch the first of the webinars uh, uh, in response to the COVID uh, crisis uh, with UNESCO Santiago Regional Office and CARICOM. I'm the new program specialist for education in the UNESCO Kingston office and happy to meet you all, even if virtually. So I'm trying to move to the next, yeah. So the raging effects of COVID-19 has resulted in the closure of educational institutions worldwide and in the Caribbean region. Estimates from the end of, from the end of April 2020 indicate that nearly 1.3 billion students worldwide are affected by COVID-19. Uh, and this equals to about 73.8% of the total enrolled learners globally. In the Latin America and the Caribbean region, over 154 million children, or about 95% of the enrolled, are temporarily out of school due to the COVID-19. And if we come specifically to the Caribbean region, according to the available data, um, nearly 7 million learners across 23 countries have been affected by COVID-19. 
these are staggering numbers. And a large number of learners have been affected by COVID-19. Now, if you look at this slide uh, uh, for uh, uh, the learners affected by COVID-19, these are the seven countries that have the highest numbers of learners affected by COVID-19. So Jamaica, we have here Jamaica, um, Trinidad and Tobago, um, Guyana, Suriname, uh, Belize, uh, Barbados, and uh, the Grenada. Uh, if you look at the levels, from pre, uh, we see that the secondary uh, education level is the highest hit and has the highest number of learners affected, followed by primary, and then um, pre-primary and tertiary, uh, depending on each country context, the numbers vary. So these are the countries with the highest number of learners, and these are the statistics available for the rest of the countries. And as we see, these are staggering numbers, and the challenge for us is going to be enormous as we move forward. Uh, we also see there's a gender disparity. Uh, while the trends are more or less the same, uh, more girls, about 3,538,192 girls are affected in the Caribbean region uh, compared with boys. Uh, the, the figures for boys are, the total figures for boys are around 3,413,001. So um, uh, it's more or less the same, but if we look at uh, hard numbers, there is a gender disparity and more girls are affected by the uh, pandemic. Today, we are focusing on the impact on teachers. And uh, uh, in the Caribbean region, our estimates suggest that about 91,710 teachers uh, are affected by COVID-19 in the Caribbean states. Uh, again, uh, we can look at the disaggregated numbers by level um, and by country. So um, again, the, uh, we see that um, you know, secondary levels are quite uh, hit the most uh, followed, uh, compared with the other levels. And uh, this is going to, I mean, when we, uh, the, the, the scale of the crisis is enormous. And this is going to call for a very concerted effort on all our parts to uh, assure that we provide support uh, and, um, and uh, to the teachers at this time. And the focus of our seminar is really looking at the different aspects uh, of uh, uh, areas where we need to provide support to teachers. So I'm going to pass the floor to the panelists. Um, uh, we just wanted to prevent, present some facts and figures to you. And, um, and, and, and today's um, uh, webinar is going to focus on some of the pressing issues um, pertaining to teachers in the Caribbean region. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Fariel. Colleagues in the room, we want to just take this opportunity. We know the challenges that Zoom has been having with being hacked. We have had that person removed, so we will not see that kind of language in the chat, so we do apologize. With that, we want to hand over to Dr. Carlos Vegas, who will give us a perspective globally. Thank you very much, uh, Lorette. Thank you, uh, Fariel, for this introduction. And good morning to all and, and to colleagues and speakers as well. Thank you for attending this, this webinar on educational responses to COVID-19. I'm very glad to see that the first webinar in the Caribbean uh, has been dedicated to the, to the frontline workers of education. Uh, that is teachers and other education personnel uh, whose current situation and working conditions are, are cause for concern and also the support that is urgently needed to carry out the work uh, that they need to do in these uncertain, in these uncertain conditions. So um, I would like to share a global perspective of the challenges that we have observed around the world and some of the responses that have been provided by different countries in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, beginning probably with the size of the challenge. As has been mentioned by, by Feriel, uh, the, the statistics of, of the pandemic are, are somehow uh, concerning. We have more than 1.5 billion students out of school worldwide, 160 million of which correspond to Latin America and the Caribbean. 
Uh, we also see 63 million primary and secondary teachers that have been affected by the pandemic. And the vast majority of them have had to adapt their work, if they manage to keep it, in a non-precedented way, by means of remote and distance education strategies to continue working with their students, and sometimes using these same channels to provide social emotional support to learners and their families. Um, as a result of COVID-19 and the ensuing school closures, uh, governments in the region led by ministries of education have rapidly implemented distance learning modalities, supporting educational staff and mobilizing parents, care caregivers, and communities with a view to ensuring continuity of learning. Sometimes, however, this has been done without due consideration of the realities experienced in certain households where the resources might not be in place to stand up to the challenge. That is the case of remote, isolated, or simply poor neighborhoods and localities where there is no connectivity, not enough mobile devices, let alone housing conditions like water and sanitation. Uh, regardless, distance education modalities that make use of a combination of technologies have been implemented in a number of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, these technologies include the internet, but also television, particularly uh, edu education TV channels, and radio, especially community radios, to reach more learners and teachers who live in places where technology is high, low, or non-existent. Um, in many cases, the quickest and most practical strategy has been to encourage teachers and students to use mobile phones and social network applications like solutions uh, that are currently used. Uh, however, the integration of different ICT tools, applications, and content in teaching plans is often conducted at the discretion of each teacher and owing to their own resources and abilities to use these technologies. Uh, despite the creativity and diversification of technologies and the possible access that learners may have to these modalities, they require exposure, abilities, and techniques that teachers may not always have. ICT-based education, distance and blended learning need teachers who are well-trained, qualified, and experienced not only to navigate the different devices and to integrate technologies into education, but to adapt to the different learning needs, rhythms, and styles of, um, of students. Uh, considering the low proportion of qualified teachers in the Caribbean, this seems like a challenge. According to the UIS, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, the percentage of qualified teachers and practitioners in, for example, early childhood care and education is only 55%. That means that half of uh, the practitioners of, or the teachers of preschool uh, do not have a qualification uh, to do so. The same goes for 76% uh, of primary education and 66% for lower secondary. This means that on average 40% of the teaching workforce in the Caribbean are yet to acquire a qualification enabling them to teach to the standards required in the different countries. And even among those teachers that are qualified, many of them report not having received training, either pre-service or in-service education, as shown by the OECD's Teaching and Learning International Survey uh, published last year. Uh, the same survey shows that globally, teaching with ICTs and distant learning is one of the greatest demands from teachers around the world. Um, there, there are fewer cases and countries from the Caribbean that have participated in TALIS, but there are four or five uh, countries in, in Latin America, and this uh, confirms actually a, a global trend. In countries where a large number of teachers have not received uh, compulsory minimum teacher training, uh, the guidance and training on how to use these new teaching resources is essential to support them, uh, to use them competently. On benefit and for the benefit of learners. Um, finally, and probably the most important point is that while distance education is not a is important, it is no substitute for traditional face-to-face -face teaching and for teachers. This is particularly the case in lower educational levels, and 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 this needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, given given that the proliferation of distance learning and the speed in which programs have been released, 
has been much greater than the quality assurance mechanisms put in place uh, to ensure uh, that quality. Uh, in countries where online educational content already exists, or in those that encourage teachers to produce their own, national authorities are establishing or reinforcing teams to review content quality before approving its dissemination through the official platforms. In other cases, online educational platforms, radio, TV broadcasts are being developed collaboratively between government and teachers or teacher representatives to ensure relevance and quality. So this is another important point that I will come back to, which has to do with the participation of teachers and, and their organizations in uh, the ideation, in the formulation and the implementation of different alternatives for education under confinement and when reopening schools. Um, so, uh, and, and, and important to say that the, the, the quality of this provision is the responsibility of government authorities as well and not on the teachers, which tend to take the blame uh, way too often. Uh, now, another area where teachers need support is in receiving and providing socio-emotional care. On the one hand, to promote the development of socio-emotional skills among learners, something that has been not only specific to this pandemic, but that should be part of education, of a holistic educational approach and a humanistic one. But particularly now, it is also needed to deal with the distress caused by the global pandemic. The context of the COVID-19 pandemic has challenged the way in which we bond together and create ties and interrogates the sources of emotional and psychological stability. What is it that keeps us sane? What is it that keeps us motivated? What is it that keeps us active? Uh, thus, maintaining psycho psychological, social and emotional well-being is difficult for all members of the educational communities, for students, for families, teachers, and educational aides. Uh, there's a number of issues caused by confinement that need to be dealt with. Among others, the concerns for health is the eventual mourning for the loss of people, job uncertainty, economic restrictions, domestic violence, and different phenomena that we have seen uh, arise and exacerbate under confinement. Um, return also, we need to consider that returning to normality to, to, the, to the schools will require considering the lived experiences and the changes that have taken place in this period. For this purpose, reflexive and integrative processes become fundamental. We need to draw lessons from a context that is revealing the key competences that teachers need uh, to deploy. And, and it is important in doing that to consider that teachers are key agents in, provide, in providing social emotional support to students and their families, but that before that, they themselves require support. So it is important that they receive support, uh, social emotional support from peers, for example, from, from other teachers, from specialized professionals, to ensure uh, that they are aware also of the local resources and that they are put into place in their localities. Um, it is also important to say, yes. Time. So okay, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll let you wrap up. I'll, you... I'll wrap up in a minute. Thank you. Uh, so it's important to say that this social emotional uh, dimension uh, is, is fundamental uh, now, particularly, and they should consider as we said, specific consequences of confinement, such as domestic violence, uh, and, and the disengagement from education that can be produced with teachers and with learners from a prolonged absence and added to that the economic and social needs. And finally, one main point, and, and I will not go in depth because I run out of time, but, but my colleague Peter from the Teacher Task Force will, will probably touch into it, which is uh, the most important dimension the status and working conditions of teachers during the crisis. It is very important that, uh, that teachers can keep their jobs. Uh, that's the main consideration, especially uh, in private education with contract teachers and those working hourly in certain subject areas that might be considered less important when prioritizing the curriculum, physical education, the arts, sometimes even history. So it is important then just to close up and to wrap up uh, that, that countries adopt uh, measures. There have been some in Latin America and the Caribbean that have opted, for example, 
to grant leave or holidays to teachers at the beginning of the pandemic, while updating and preparing different learning spaces like TV, radio, internet. Others have worked with them in developing content and special programs, but I would say the most important is to, to guarantee that teachers uh, keep their jobs, that they are protected under working conditions according to international standards like the ILO UNESCO recommendation on the status of teachers. Uh, thank you, Lorette. Most welcome, Carlos. Thank you very much. So we will now move to Dr. Freddie James. And Dr. James is go uh, going to be sharing her screen. And I will ask Dr. James, when you see my video come on, that's an indication that your time is up. So I don't have I to cut your screen of thought. <laughs> Thank I you. Very much. Much like that. Okay, Good so to everyone to and welcome. And uh, I will start with my um, video and I might keep it on just in case it um I'm just hoping that we don't lose bandwidth. I was asked to present today on the issue of supporting teachers in distance learning. Um, Loretta, should I begin or? You go ahead, Freddie. Okay. So, when we talk about, When we talk about learning, anything concerning learning, I think it's very important for us to qualify what we mean by learning because we don't all mean the same thing and we don't all see, align our thoughts in terms of what learning really is. Some, so learning in terms of this presentation is a process that leads to change which occurs as a result of experience and increases the potential for improved performance and future learning. This is a definition by Ambrose et al. 2010. Implicit in this definition is a notion that the change in the learner may happen at the level of knowledge, attitude, or behavior. As a result of learning, learners come to see concepts, ideas, and or the world differently. So some change is taking place and it takes place over time and it takes place as part of a process. Learning is not something done to students, but rather something students themselves do. It is the direct result of how students interpret and respond to their experiences. So learning is not something that is given to you or done to you. Learning is something that you're supposed to experience. And we would know that anything we experience will have various facets to it that would create this experience. So I'll move over to that to talk about that now. So when we talk about distance education and distance learning and online learning, which would be some of the terms that you would come to, to hear, we really need to qualify these terms. And I've chosen to do that by pointing out the slight difference between distance learning and online learning. Any learning that takes place where the teachers and students work from a distance, they're not close or face-to-face, -face, is distance education. But when we talk about distance learning in particular and how it has come through over history, where in the past tapes would be sent to people, for example, in different countries or different parts of, the, the, of a country with the information that would precipitate the learning, um, that, that process and then the internet came in and afforded a different kind of virtual connection in a distance learning environment. But the teacher and the students did not necessarily have to be present within a classroom at the same time. And, and we refer to this to as uh, working asynchronously. In online learning, Teachers are present with students in the virtual classroom as they deliver live instruction, and we call this 
synchronous. So there's a little um, difference in terms of being putting materials up, for example, for students, having them use the material, providing feedback that can be done asynchronously. And that is different from if the teachers and the students are together interacting and uh, live in a live environment and instruction is being delivered in an environment that, that is two-way and in real time. But nevertheless, you um, could split hairs over these students, distance learning, online learning. Whether distance or online, for learning to take place, the teaching must be inspiring and the learning must be empowering. So what does learning or what should learning look like in any environment, be it um, on distance, a distance learning environment, an online environment, or be it face-to-face? -face? Learning comprises of attitudes. These are the types of learning that will take place, attitudes and values. There'll be some which, which speaks to a person's beliefs. There will be cultural, some cultural activities. There's a social aspect of learning, which is interactive and communicating. There's a psychomotor in terms of doing active learning taking place. There's content, which is information, knowledge, and so on being part of it. There's intellectual aspect to learning as well, which deals with the critical thinking. Which, which these with problem solving and that kind of thing. And all of these should be present in any learning environment. So when we move from the face-to-face -face environment to the online environment, we have to be sure that we are catering for all the types of learning to take place. And from a teacher's perspective, this is what learning will probably look like for a teacher. I will not go through all of, of, of these um, aspects on the slide in the interest of time. And this is what a, a teacher strives for. A high, the highly effective teacher will want to, to use their, these different strategies and, and have these different competencies, like um, critical thinking, being able to make critical connections, using group work, and uh, have a sense of an understanding of research that applies to, to learning and so on. So to get to the meat of the matter, how to support, and, and the, the issue is to support the preparation of teachers for a distance learning environment. And I'm glad that Dr. Vargas raised the issue that teachers do need support because they are on the front line in education in providing social, emotional, psychological and other supports for our young people and in the case of principals for our teachers. So in order to, to help prepare them, what we need to do is to communicate. I, I have put a whole bunch of C's here. Communicate changes clearly and compassionately with teachers and consistently provide updates. Competence, to provide professional learning and resources for teachers to gain the confidence and ability to work in the online environment. Teachers cannot be moved from a face-to-face -face without any sort of professional learning. So going to go into an online teaching and learning environment without having some skill, having been prepared to do so. Create. Create a feel safe and empowering environment for teachers to learn new skills. It's not only students that need to be empowered, but teachers need to be empowered as well. Collaborate with all stakeholders, parents, students, community, the whole lot, to build leadership capacity and commitment to change. Collegiality. Connect teachers to various networks, social, educational, cultural, and others to maintain well-being and create an internal community of support. Next, continuous monitoring and evaluation, and this is essential, to reflect on how the initiative is working, what gaps need to be filled, 
and what needs to change. So it requires some measure of flexibility. Continuous feedback to know how teachers are coping and to let them know how they are doing. We need to create innovative instructional materials using affordable, reliable, and user-friendly tools. We also need to help them design engaging and empowering online learning experiences. You cannot just take the same lessons you were doing in a classroom, a face-to-face -face classroom, and do the same lesson in an online environment. You may find you need to create new materials and also to design a more engaging and empowering online experience. So what um, needs to be done is to build a toolkit for teachers with, with online learning experiences. I've just put up a few uh, tools there that are available, free, most of them free. And um, I know people can go online and check out the various tools, so I'll skip this one. In terms of reopening, and, and this is very, very critical, Reopen it really is a process of transitioning. Transitioning from one a, a, a turbulent environment into now an environment where you're expected to create a, 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 a sense of normalcy. The COVID-19 has presented us with some turbulence and therefore the approach should be a phased approach to reopen and an approach that caters to the physical, emotional, social, cultural, and spiritual aspects of people. The reopening process involves not just creating structures and systems or having strategies and a plan, it involves most of all, key is people. What people do will bring about the, the change, what people do, will bring about the, the process, no matter what structures or systems are put in place. My advice would be to develop strategies, strategies that will, will indicate why you are doing what you're doing. Having done that, create a plan. I think we may have lost you. I was standing myself. Yeah. One more minute, according to me. So I'm yeah. just closing here. Finally, um, you, the collaboration among all stakeholders, again, support, monitor, evaluate, and revise. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for that, Freddie. A lot of interesting material for us to keep in mind and take into consideration as we think about the reopening of school. And it goes well with the information that was shared by, by Carlos. So we will move right on to Dr. Roderick Rodda, and he will share a little bit with us about the policy implications for teaching during a health emergency. So Dr. Rodda is the Deputy Chief Education Officer for the Ministry of Education in Bali. Dr. Rodda? Thank you, thank you, Laurette. Uh, just trying to ensure that the PowerPoint is actually working. Well, it was showing just now, and yeah, there you go. The slides are not moving. Oh dear. We are seeing your slide. We are seeing your screen. The first one in. Okay, wow. yes, it's moving now. Okay, fine, thank you. Okay, in the, in the specific case of the, good morning to everyone, and I welcome this opportunity to share with you some of the experiences that we have garnered here in Barbados as a result of the COVID-19 experience, which has impacted not only Barbados, but the Caribbean and Latin America in a, in a major way. My presentation will cover the emergency policy responses and its implications for teachers and teaching across several areas. One, looking at the teaching modality and the shift that has been required for teaching 
factors to make from the regular face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching. The technological platforms, which will be adopted to facilitate the online learning. The building of pedagogical capacity among teachers who have to transition from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching. The demand for increased technology and access to appropriate devices for teachers and students, as well as issues relating to connectivity. Addressing the whole question of the improvement in the curriculum readiness, as well as content and instruction. The configuration of virtual schools and classrooms and the introduction of appropriate protocols to facilitate this transition. The implementation of psychosocial, emotional, and family support systems for teachers, students, and families the development of monitoring and evaluation of learning mechanisms as we seek to implement an, an unusual approach to the delivery of education. And finally, the issue of enhancement of the cybersecurity and privacy and data protection. Now, at the outset, I must indicate that like all countries across the globe, there was the immediate closure of all public and private educational institutions at the declaration of the national state of emergency relating to the health crisis brought about by COVID-19. As a result, education officials considered several strategies to ensure and maintain the continuity of learning, especially for marginalized and the most vulnerable students in our population. We also gave serious consideration to the escalation of teacher training to ensure that there was capacity across the school system to move from face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching. And the ministry also took a position to declare the utilization of an online platform to facilitate the teaching and learning process, as well as to determine that there should be the consolidation of the last two terms were rather than the introduction of new concepts during this particular environment. And therefore, I would want to go straight into some of the actions that were taken by Barbados to try to address the needs of the education system here. And the first one relates to the whole question of building the pedagogical capacity across the country to ensure that teachers were placed in a position to be able to deliver online teaching. And this resulted in the immediate training of the information technology coordinators across all of our public schools, who in turn were given or charged with the responsibility of facilitating the training of teachers in each school to ensure that the competencies of the teaching staff were built to ensure the transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online delivery of instruction using a, the technological platform. This also resulted in the need for fundamental changes to the instructional design and presentation skills for teachers. Whereas before the focus would have been on face-to-face, -face, it now meant preparing lessons in a new way to ensure the engagement of synchronous teaching. And also to ensure that teachers were given the opportunity within their schools and across the national system to share best teaching practices and to collaborate with one another as we engage in traversing uncharted waters as it relates to the utilization of these new technologies. In this process, the Ministry of Education would have facilitated the preparation of several training guides, protocols, and informational videos which have been placed on the ministry's website and disseminated to teachers across the system to help guide the transition process. We would have also engaged in um, engaging with the, the unions, the principals and school administrators to ensure that the national plan and strategy for the transition would have been as smooth as possible. But our major challenge related to the whole question of technological capacity it was quickly recognized that there would have been a shortage of devices for teachers to facilitate online instruction and for students to participate in online learning, especially among the most vulnerable. And what the Ministry of Education in Barbados would have done 
was to engage in partnerships and made an appeal to the corporate sector to facilitate a national drive for the G Suite for Education Tech Drive, which sought to gain the support and contribution of laptops and other devices such as tablets to ensure that every child in Barbados would have access to a device to facilitate online learning. The Ministry of Education also gave consideration to working with the Ministry of Finance to provide an investment and incentives for teachers to actually purchase their own devices in circumstances where the ministry was not in a position to provide devices for every teacher. We've also worked on providing a help desk so that parents and, and students and teachers can call the ministry or sub submit emails to gain assistance and technical support at this time in managing the technological transition. Therefore, the ministry's website would have been updated to provide information and videos, as well as to carry information relating to the national communication and PR campaign to ensure that teachers were well aware as to how best they can facilitate the transition. We've also had critical partnership from the internet service providers, Digicel and Flow, who have come on board to zero rate or to make free of charge access to a range of e-learning platforms on their mobile networks, such as Google Classroom, Google Meets, and other websites. And this, in effect, made the technological capacity available to over 2,600 teachers across our national system, as well as 35,000 students who could have access to learning opportunities using the e-learning platforms available. As a consequence of this change, consideration was given to utilizing every available option to teachers, whether it be the use of audio, video, radio, television, and online sources, as well as the access to digital books, textbooks, and eBooks, so that teachers and students can continue the learning process. As a result, Efforts are currently on the way to digitize existing content and as well as to develop new content. And in this regard, a partnership has been forged between the Ministry of Education and the National Cultural Foundation in Barbados where artists who would traditionally be participating in our national carnival, Corpova, are now working with schools, working with teachers to develop new content for the provision of material to our students. Teachers are currently also engaged in the configuration of the virtual classrooms. Instruction has already started with teachers being able to work with our, the, the students synchronously. And we've also seen the modification of timetables, the modification of the duration of lessons, the issue of protocols relating to the, the screen time for students, especially the younger students, where we've decided to place a limit of a, a maximum of 20 minutes screen time for the younger students who will be engaged in synchronous learning exercises. But more importantly, provision has been made for counseling support for the, the psychosocial, emotional, and other support for teachers, students and families at this time, where through the Ministry of Education, virtual counseling and telecounseling uh, options have been made available. We've established a hotline where parents and students and others can call the ministry to get support as it relates to the psychosocial and other needs of students and families. And one important thing we must highlight here is that we recognize that there are students who would have been in need of a feeding program who would have been normally fed through our school system. And the Ministry of Education has made provision for students to still have access to meals, even though the schools are closed at this point in time. I can't spend enough time now to go into the monitoring and evaluation aspect, but the change to, from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning will require effective monitoring and evaluation 
to determine whether or not the, the learning goals are being achieved by teachers and students and parents. And therefore, that is a dimension in which the Ministry of Education will have to dive into because this change to online learning will require a high level of self-directed learning, significant self-discipline, and strong support from families and parents to ensure that students are able to continue their learning. And finally, the whole question of the enhancement of cybersecurity, improved cybersecurity, ensuring the protection of students' learning rights, as well as their right to privacy, ensuring that there's effective protection of their, their educational data, and also ensuring that there is the compliance with the National Data Protection Act in Barbados. At this point, I, I hand over to you, Laura. I hope Thanks. I've been on time. Uh, no, you're not, but that's all right. And very interesting information. Thanks for that, Roger. Uh, pointing out in some very systematic ways in which we have to respond in a holistic way to the current situation to ensure a 360 view of our reality, knowing that education is quite a complex practice. And it takes us nicely into the next presentation that will be given to us by Mr. Mark Light. And he's gonna focus on safeguarding the teaching, professional and conditions of work for teachers. Mark is the president of the Guyana Teachers Union. So I hand over to Mark. Mark, your mic, mic is muted. Good morning and thank you, Lorette. Thanks to UNESCO and CARICOM for the opportunity to make this brief presentation on the, on the topic, safeguarding the teaching profession and the conditions for work. I wish to touch briefly on how we should take safeguarding teaching profession and conditions of work. Safeguarding in this slide, referring to a measure taken to protect someone or something or to prevent something undesirable. In relation to teaching profession, according to Eric Coyle and Peter John, in their article, Professional Knowledge and Professional Practice, listed as general characteristics of a profession, the possession and use of expert or specialized skills, knowledge, the exercise of, an, of autonomous thought and judgment and responsibility to students, parents, and wider society through a voluntary commitment to a set of principles. In relation to conditions of work, we are referring to the work environment and all existing circumstances affecting labor in the workplace, including of our physical aspects, legal rights, and responsibility. Some of the areas that I wish to touch on as I make this presentation would be referring to five salient points that um, are really critical as we work to safeguard the teaching profession and our working condition. The 1960s, the UNESCO Convention Against Discrimination in Education is the first legitimate and binding instrument covering extensively the right to education. So we need to recognize that international legal framework on the right to education and the teaching profession must be implemented. The same as eliminating discrimination in education and promote the principles of equality of opportunities and treatment. With regard to the teachers, Article 40 of the Convention engages a party to provide training to the teaching profession without discrimination. The conditions, qualifications, rights, and duties of the teaching personnel are further protected by the ILO UNESCO recommendations concerning the status of teachers, 1960 and the UNESCO recommendations concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel, 1997. I also wish to point out that if we are going to um, work to implement those international legal frameworks to protect um, and to safeguard our teachers, we must have a strict system within the Caribbean to monitor and to see the implementation of standards on the teaching profession. 
we need to establish a task force regionally, like the task force established by the committee, in fact, established by ILO, UNESCO, um, Committee of Experts on the Application of the Recommendations Concerning Teaching Personnel, CERT. This is a committee of independent experts in charge of promoting and monitoring the implementation of the 1960 and 1997 recommendations. CERT examine reports on the application of the recommendations that are submitted by government, by national organizations representing teachers and their employers, and by relevant intergovernmental or non-governmental organizations. It is very critical at this juncture if we are to safeguard the teaching profession to ensure that we have a strict monitoring system to, to, the, to observe and, and monitor the standard as it relates to teaching. Another area that is critical would be recruitment and retention of teachers. The focus should be on helping teachers to create supportive school structure, develop new school in sector framework, which will focus on tackling teachers' workers. We know that as a result of COVID-19, teachers may I'm be sorry, required Mark. Mark, to work Mark, apologies for stopping you, but we are getting some serious challenges with the audio and we suspect it might be the bandwidth. So I would want to ask that given that you're not sharing a, a video, can you turn off your video? That might help with the bandwidth challenge we're having. And let's sure. try that. Yeah, good. Let's try that. So I was making the point that recruitment and retention is another area that is, that is significant. And the focus should be on helping learners helping leaders to create supportive school structure. That is, develop new school inspection framework, which will focus on tackling teacher workload. Initiate ways to improve support for teachers at an early stage in their careers, including induction period, as well as continuous professional development program. We also need to ensure that a career in teaching remains attractive to teachers as their careers and lives develop. For example, by developing specialized qualifications to support clearer non-leadership career pathways, such as establishing a pathway for master teachers to so with. Uh, simplify the process of becoming a teacher, including the induction of a new one-stop application service for new teachers. This approach will ensure that there is adequate supply available of teachers with the requisite skills skill set to service teaching needs. As we know, um, we have to focus on the kind of skill, set, skill sets that are required presently to address the needs of our learners, and as well as improve uh, the teacher's skills so that they can present using the various platforms. Look at measures to train and upskill teachers in specific areas like mathematics, and science ICT. We must also consider introducing a national teacher vacancy website. A fourth area that I wish to focus on, and that which was mentioned by several presenters before, the role of technology, digital transformation that is needed locally. The discussion about technology focuses on job creation and not destruction. You have to be very mindful of this because with the introduction of technology, we need to safeguard um, the employment of teachers because we can, we can very well find that teachers are um, going to be uh, not, not be in the forefront in terms of their presentation because we can use technology to their disadvantage. There is need for reskilling teachers. There is need for reskilling teachers to meet the digitalized needs of the education sector. Technology can free teachers from arduous labor, that is, writing lesson plans and preparing report booklets for learners, which is done manually in many instances. But technology-driven processes can also render labor superfluous, ultimately alienating teachers and stunning their development. It can reduce work control and autonomy, as well as the richness of work content, resulting in a potential de-skilling and decline in their satisfaction. 
Realizing the potential of technology and the future of teaching depends on fundamental choices about work design, including reliance on detail. What, what is it that the teachers are required to do? Discussion between teachers and management is critical. The threat is heightened through the privatization of education, which is um, gaining the attention of many educators worldwide. Hence, the role of technology must be clearly articulated and documented as a means to support teachers as they execute their roles in education, even as we are dealing with this pandemic. It must be used as a means of boosting and not eradicating teachers from the system. Learners need teachers, not robots, to interact with them. Teachers are in need of training to boost their technological competencies. This is also there is also the need for psychosocial support as they embrace this new model. And finally, the role of the trade union. The role of the trade union is extremely critical. This would include the support or recommendation of policies for members, frequent meetings with government, especially the education ministry. Um, some of the areas of discussion we believe from a union perspective, would be to address the issue of remote learning and its role in addressing teachers. Discussion on whether a blended model approach can help to put and help to fill some of the gaps must be placed among partners. Teacher compensation globally, whether it is competitive. This will address the problem of teacher retention in the Caribbean and what needs to be done. Teachers' current condition of service. Are teachers competent? Should there be minimum standards? Should some of the minimum standards be provision of resources, class size, mentoring, um, coaching? You know, we have to focus on, 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 on a lot of these things. As well as, should education regulations be reviewed in light of COVID-19, like the Education Act in Guyana? And most importantly, ensure that steps are taken to provide a healthy environment for teachers in post COVID 19. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mark. We had a lot of audio challenges, but I suspect that uh, as it comes to that last section that you've just shared in terms of the role of the union, I am watching the chat, so I suspect that a question related to that is going to come up and we would get another opportunity to return to some of the issues that you have articulated. Uh, so uh, thanks again, and colleagues, we will now go on to the final presentation for today, uh, which would be shared by Peter Wallet, and he is from UNESCO headquarters from the Teacher Task Force. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my presentation here. Um, so thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, it's still morning there, I imagine. Uh, thank you so much to all the previous speakers for the excellent uh, presentations and, and illustrations of, of what is going uh, on uh, on the ground in terms of uh, how uh, countries are supporting teachers. Very pleased to be here and uh, to talk about in particular about the teacher task force and the advocacy work and other areas where the teacher task force uh, works. Um, it's a network, uh, for, for those who are not familiar with it, it's a, it's a network of over 140 organizations and countries that support teachers and teaching, and it is hosted uh, at UNESCO headquarters uh, in Paris. As you aware, are aware, uh, most governments have uh, uh, temporarily closed uh, educational institutions of various levels across the world. And the data has been changing, of course. I mean, this is a bit, uh, this is a, from a couple of weeks ago or so. So uh, schools have begun opening uh, in many parts around the world, but up to 91% of the world's population are st of learners uh, were, were temporarily out of school. And we know this is uh, going to have impacts in terms of uh, global goals of the SDG4, uh, as well as uh, there's the potential for the ex exacerbation of uh, learning inequities. Teachers, of course, are, are the, uh, the backbone of the education system, and they are uh, basically the frontline workers, if we want to call them that, uh, involved in ensuring continued learning, 
and, uh, uh, and uh, the continuance of, of uh, education. Um, so in light of this, uh, the teacher task force um, uh, released a, a call for action, uh, which encourages stakeholders to recognize uh, the critical role that teachers play in the response uh, and recovery strategies related to COVID-19. This was released and available um, on our website, uh, amongst other places online. Uh, this, uh, this document, this key document, um, identifies six key points in terms of how we, how we need to support uh, teachers and protecting uh, the teaching profession during this uh, difficult time. Um, as as uh, Carlos mentioned before, uh, one of the main areas uh, that uh, we advocate for, of course, is the preservation of employment and wages. So this, this context uh, uh, and crisis cannot be uh, a, uh, an opportunity for, uh, for norms to be pushed aside in terms of labor rights um, and uh, the entire teaching force and salaries and benefits uh, need to be preserved uh, throughout this period. Uh, it also stresses how uh, we need to prioritize teachers uh, and of course learners health, safety and well-being. There is a, a lot of anxiety uh, amongst uh, schools in, in the process of returning to the classroom uh, amongst teachers and families. Uh, but in terms of teachers, uh, we, we stress about the need for socio-emotional support to, to face these uh, extra uh, pressures resulting from uh, ensuring students are, are learning and, uh, and that's a healthy class environment. And of course, the health of, uh, and the well-being of the teachers uh, themselves in this. Uh, so these, this is an unprecedented uh, situation. Uh, we also need to be thinking in terms of the third item, uh, including teachers in developing the COVID-19 education responses. So it is, it, it's imperative that the involvement of teachers and the represent, representatives, are uh, their voices are heard in terms of designing uh, not just the short-term approaches, but also the long-term solutions uh, to COVID-19 during the return to school, and as well as longer-term planning in terms of recurrence, possible recurrences of the, of the pandemic and, and uh, further interruptions to the educational process. Uh, so this is a key uh, in terms of uh, ensuring uh, development of a successful uh, response uh, strategy. Uh, the fourth item uh, really talks about uh, professional development and the need for an adequate amount of support and professional development for teachers. Many, many teachers are not uh, necessarily well versed in the use of ICTs uh, or using alternative uh, methodologies uh, where, where ICTs are, are absent. Uh, the, this, the very suddenness of this pandemic uh, resulted in the fact that many teachers were thrust very, very quickly into a situation where they were not necessarily prepared. Uh, and of course, even during the, uh, the, re the return phase where there could be um, blended situations of, of children at home and, and children uh, in the classroom um, and potential uh, um, interruptions as well requ requires a lot of uh, additional support and, and innovative approaches to ensure teachers have the ICT skills and, and other pedagogical skills and time management to, to ensure that they, uh, they're prepared for this. Uh, equity, of course, is at the heart of the education response, the, the, the fifth item. Uh, a, a lot of recent data has demonstrated quite clearly that there are uh, inequities uh, globally uh, between countries within regions, uh, within countries themselves, in terms of learners who have access to ICT and, and connectivity and those who don't in the home. Um, for instance, um, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 89% of learners do not have access to household computers. Um, so governments need to be uh, proactive in this in this situation and, and uh, uh, well regulated and monitored and well monitored uh, public partner pu public private partnerships uh, can be a potential uh, means for mitigation of these of these issues. We also uh, advocate for an adequate social and psychological support to the families who are most uh, disadvantaged uh, during this time. And of course, the the, the final item in the uh, call for action talks about that teachers need to be included in aid responses. So financial, uh, international financial aid to support the education system in terms of recovery and the return to school uh, need to consider, um, especially in the world's poorest countries and the, where the most disadvantaged children are, 
uh, we need to be thinking about the issue and the role of, that teachers play uh, in, uh, in education and the recovery phase. Um, I also would like to talk about, uh, this is the new teacher toilet, the new teacher task force knowledge platform. Uh, so the, the task force does more than advocacy. One of the, the main uh, things that the task force is also involved in is also knowledge creation and knowledge sharing. So this is a new, uh, basically it's the new website and part of this new website is a knowledge hub uh, that the task force has uh, just re uh, released about uh, a week ago. So this aims to become uh, the global main central repository on issues related to teachers and teaching. It's uh, targeting uh, policymakers, but also teacher educators. So it is intended to be uh, a one uh, destination where uh, cutting edge and uh, current uh, information, literature, uh, techniques, and uh, um, um, useful information for, uh, to support uh, the role of teachers in the education process is, is there in this one place. Um, so I would also like to talk about, uh, we also have a role beyond, the third component is also we do uh, country support. So one of the main elements uh, in which the teacher task force uh, conducts country support is through the dissemination uh, and the support and uh, liaising with countries in terms of uh, the teacher uh, policy development guide. Uh, so this was uh, developed to help countries develop comprehensive and uh, holistic uh, teacher policies uh, in their countries. It was created as a consultative uh, process with contributions and inputs from experts, consultants, um, global partners, um, as well as the TTF uh, secretariat and its steering committee. Uh, so it, it, it's key in terms of acknowledging uh, the role of teachers in achieving uh, SDG4. The summary was uh, published in uh, several languages in 2015 uh, in English, Spanish, French, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, and Portuguese. The full English version uh, was released last year in 2019 with other language versions to, to be released uh, in 2020. Um, it includes uh, several chapters on uh, uh, background contextualization. Uh, the most important component is, is its discussion of the nine dimensions that, that one needs to integrate in a comprehensive teacher policy ranging from recruitment and retention to training to working conditions to teacher accountability to to uh, various other dimensions that are that are key uh, when uh, when developing and designing uh, comprehensive teacher policies uh, the key messages however are that uh, a teacher policy must be holistic and comprehensive uh, the different dimensions uh, need to be integrated uh, the teacher policy should be aligned with education systems and national, other national policies. Uh, the policy must be context sensitive, so it responds to country needs. And uh, a comprehensive teacher policy is critical uh, to meet teacher quality and effective learning. So I will uh, stop there. Uh, and that, so that gives you an overview of uh, the teacher task force. Um, it's, uh, its role, uh, it's a key role in, in advocacy, but also in terms of supporting countries and uh, getting information uh, related to teachers and uh, uh, to policymakers and uh, educators. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for that, Peter. Well appreciated. And it rounds us up nicely in terms of the issues that we have been facing. Now, what keeps reoccurring as we engage in a conversation about what's the role of teachers in this response? We see a key and a critical role for teachers to be partners in the response to COVID-19. But more than just being partners, we also see that it is important that we care for the well-being of all our stakeholders. Quite often, it's easy for us to begin to think about the children and the children are important. They will always be important. But as part of this response, we also need to be thinking about the well-being of our teachers, the well-being of our students, 
and the well-being of our entire community. We are at the point in, this, in the webinar where we're going to take some questions and we have 35 questions in the platform. Some of them are connected to each other and I'm going to then give our presenters the opportunity to respond to these questions. But before I do so, there was some critical information, Mark, that you were sharing with us before your audio got really bad about the role of the union it's towards the last end of your presentation and i'd like you to i'd like to give you the opportunity to return to that for us very quickly in a minute so if you can in a minute indicate to us and that's your first question that i'll be posing to you what's the role of the union at this time as we think about supporting teachers in their role as part of the response and recovery and resilience in the face of covid 19 so mark over to you Thank you, Lauren. Um, I hope you're hearing me now. Yes, let's hope it stays clear like that. Go ahead. Yes, um, we, we see a very important role for the union um, post COVID-19 and even as we battle this pandemic, is to find ways in which we can assist with um, professional development sessions since many of our teachers um, are not fully inclined with some of the platforms, or they're not knowledgeable with some of the platforms, but um, we are asked to utilize for the e learning process. And as such, the union has to um, work to ensure that we collaborate with other partners in education to provide the support needed by teachers. A second thing um, would be enabling our teachers to receive the necessary psychosocial support that they need because um, being a teacher in a virtual setting is different than a face-to-face -face setting. And you've already got the feedback that several teachers are overwhelmed with the volume of work that they are asked to, to, to carry out, especially way beyond um, the regular school day having to treat with um, children being at home and all of that is a real challenge for many of our teachers. So providing that kind of psychosocial support, partnering with other, um, um, other education partners to provide that support. Another role we believe that is critical is to ensure that our teaching standards are observed and that we have minimum teaching standards being um, implemented across the Caribbean as we speak. Um, we know that class size will be critical as we go forward. Um, monitoring and evaluation will be important um, in this whole process. And I believe as we embrace the online platforms that we are asked to support, there should be um, policy changes. Um, especially in the different countries where those policies exclusively would have addressed um, would have addressed the face-to-face -face kind of um, implementation of the curriculum. We are now having to look at policies as to how that can be addressed. So name of few. Thanks for that, Mark. And we are getting a fantastic recommendation, Mark. If you can type that response in the chat, because we did have some breakup in the audio. So it'd be good if you can pop it into the chat so persons could give that consideration. As you do that, I'll ask all our panelists to turn their computers on so we can see your faces. And what we want to maintain the connectivity with the real person as we go forward uh, and as we deal with the questions that are being posed for us uh, in the chat. So question number one, and of course the question is as we think about the well-being of our stakeholders, some of my colleagues like to say clients, the question is what new measures do you foresee need to be in place to assist educators with coping, in coping with their own well-being and their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? So uh, maybe two members of the panel uh, could respond to that question, and I'll repeat it again. Just raise your hand if you want to take it. What new measures do you foresee need to be in place to assist educators in coping with their own well-being and their students as a result of the pandemic? 
Carlos, is that you raising your hand for Carlos? Any other member of our team wants to take that? Freddie has smiled nicely at me, so I'm assuming you would you would take it. So Carlos, you want to go first? Sure. I, I would just like to, to share uh, what, what we've seen in some countries, both globally and, and in the region, uh, and particularly in terms of uh, networking, which is already something that, that, that should happen within, within teacher continuous professional development. Uh, but mostly so in this, in this circumstance, we see the role of, of, of social dialogue and the role of networking between peers, uh, uh, between teachers and, and other practitioners to share their experience of, of, of how they're living through this especially because many of the, of the measures that have been ideated, that have been developed, as I said before, have been of their own accord, their own initiative and with their own resources of teachers. So given the lack of resources out there, I would say that these networks, these communities of practice are very helpful in, in, in developing tools, ideas, strategies, to support one another, so a lot of a lot of the sharing is cathartic, so so that's supportful in a way, but also uh, ideas and initiatives to to support uh, families and and communities and learners, particularly in situations that have been uh, where, where where the affectations have been serious, not only not only emotionally but also socially, economically, and and even physically, in the case of in the case of violence that we've seen rise out of the overcrowding of, of households. So that's the that's first idea. Freddie, you want to follow up? Yeah, I agree with what um, Carlos has said. And to take it a little further, one of the things that I, I feel is, is critical for, for teachers in particular is for teachers to be communicated to in a very clear and direct way to support them in terms of what they have to do. Because if they don't know what is required of them, they may not necessarily know what tools, what skills, what internal mechanisms they need to, to address and who to go to to address these mechanisms. And I'm saying it has to be a coordinated effort. It has to be coordinated from the top in terms of the ministries of education in various territories, because it will have to be a collaborative approach to taking care of the well-being of teachers in the first place. And even as we do that, we involve parents in terms of helping teachers to take care of the well-being of students. Many teachers lack the confidence to function effectively in an online environment. And there's a sense in which it is unfair to put them in that position. But there's also the other side of it in terms of this is not something new. It has been with us for many years in terms of charting a path that uses the technology in a more effective way to bring education and to bring learning to various parts of the world and to various parties. And therefore I feel there is some responsibility too that should be taken on the part of, of educators to move the tools that we use to learn with forward, to engage in and empower ourselves to meet the needs of our profession. You know, we can't keep saying that somebody else will have to do it. We have to say to somebody else as well, we need this in order to function. But at the same time, what should also be happening is that territories should take the responsibility to say, let us make this happen for our teachers and students. 
Thanks for that, Freddie. And right on the back of the question around the well-being, and Freddie, you talked about the, the fact that teachers need help in, in functioning and responding in an online environment. We recognize that a large percentage of our teachers within the Latin American and the Caribbean region may be struggling with digital literacy. So what then do we consider? Um, so the question really is, do you consider this aspect to be more important an obstacle than poor and unequal connectivity? And then what could be the solution? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, trying to prioritize whether the challenge confronting us is the digital illiteracy of our teachers or addressing the poor and unequal connectivity of not just students, but teachers themselves. So who wants to take a shot at that? Peter? Mark, and I will volunteer Roderick because I know it has policy implications. So we'll go in order on my screen, left to right, so that you first, Peter. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, think, um, I think given the, the nature of the, the crisis that we're in, um, I mean, it's, it's clear that, uh, that distance education provides the, and online learning uh, provide the best opportunities for maintaining uh, a semblance of, of, a, of a, a continuation of quality education. However, um, and it's clear that there are uh, s s significant challenges, whether it's poor connectivity, the lack of access to computers, uh, um, uh, slow broadband, uh, the lack of devices in the home, the, the, the lack of uh, teachers being trained in, 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 in order to use them. Uh, I think the I mean, the focus clearly, I mean, needs to be on, I think, pragmatic solutions. Uh, these, these venues are going to be very, very popular to, to countries to explore. And uh, it's, it's, but everything's happening very sudden. And, and I mean, investments in this area are going to, pr are going to prove to be very, very useful uh, in the future. But I mean, in the short term nature of the situation that uh, I think we find ourselves in, countries also have to be very pragmatic in terms of using uh, other means at their disposal, whether these uh, mean uh, uh, using um, some of the more traditional technologies, whether, whether it's radio or television, and teachers also need to be you know, um, uh, trained on those, on those areas. And, and there's, uh, um, there's uh, ample opportunity, uh, I would hope, for uh, different types of, uh, uh, of community um, and engagement in, in terms of how do we sort of share these kinds of tools and the know-how in terms of using it. Um, but, um, you know, there's also uh, things where uh, home-based packages and uh, printout materials that need to be exploited as well. So I, I think, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, where you have, uh, um, uh, you don't have ubiqu ubiquitous internet or connectivity or devices, a really pragmatic and, and rapid approach needs to be considered that uh, uses all forms of technology and uh, and means of uh, the continu continuation of learning. But uh, of course, I mean, teachers need to be supported at the same time. They need to be feel that they have the confidence to do it. They need the support from the community and from the ministries and the, and the uh, departmental or district offices and, and education leaders to, to be able to do that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a significant challenge, but uh, it's an opportunity to, uh, to really move ahead in many different ways. So. Yes, um, oh, Mark, you're going next, so go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Larry. Um, basically, um, I think we recognize that the level of competency for teachers um, in terms of their ability to use some of the online platforms would be um, one of the issues here, as well as the um, connectivity. In terms of money, but if I speak in relation to Guyana, we can divide the Guyana um, Guyana community, the community that we serve in education, in three areas: coastland, riverine, and the hinterland areas. And we find that in some areas, it is virtually impossible to have any form of connectivity um, utilizing the internet. Um, so for the different modalities to address the needs of the learner um, in a Diana setting. And I know this would be so in several other countries within 
Caribbean international airport. So there is a need for teachers to have better training and also for different modalities to be adopted to address different communities who have varying challenges. Um, if you look at our teachers in the hinterland and the riverine areas, they would not have access generally to internet. So you have to use like radio and television, um, newspapers, even in instances the newspapers would actually get in there uh, maybe a week after it is published. So um, you have to look at the context in, in different areas. So I can speak of a Guyana uh, situation where different modalities would have to be used and people are going to be affected in different ways. Thanks for that, Mark. I'll also ask you to type that response for us in the chat because we lost you a bit and you were raising some important peculiarities about the Guyana context with the hinterland and the riverine um, reality. Uh, in particular, I recognize the great inequity in the ways in which the infrastructure is distributed around, across the landscape. And that's just not applicable to Guyana. It would be applicable to a number of different contexts. So it'd be fantastic, Mark, if you can just summarize your points and pop it into the chat there as part of your response. I'm going to hand over to Roderick now. So, Roderick, your response? Yes, I, and I think your last statement really captures it very well because until the emergency situation arose, there was always the assumption that there was ready access to internet connectivity and that teachers um, were quite capable of utilizing the technologies, and making the transitions. While it is a lot easier to facilitate the training and development of capacity among teachers in terms of their skills and competencies to utilize the existing technologies, whether it be um, the traditional ones such as radio, television, and video, or the more modern ones like utilizing the Google Classroom and other technologies, that in itself can be done even in a virtual environment. But the greater challenge really is ensuring that the investment that is required to ensure that all students and teachers have access to devices is critical because what we've discovered is that not all households have access to electricity. Not all households have access to um, internet connectivity. Even some teachers have their own challenges with a lack of devices. And in Barbados, what we've done, we've sought to reach out to the corporate sector to support us in our drive to ensure that no child and no teacher would be left behind by virtue of making donations of whether it be laptops, tablets, or other devices, or distribution to students who are most vulnerable, um, to, to teachers to ensure that they too can make that transition to facilitating the online learning environment. And therefore, I think we have to strike some level of balance between preparing our teachers for the digital transformation, as well as ensuring that, that households and students have access because this emergency situation will present to us a new opportunity for us to address future challenges because schools will be disrupted in some way or another in the future. And by virtue of utilizing this opportunity, for example, you may have instances where schools have to be um, closed because of an environmental issue in a particular jurisdiction or some other challenge like that. And having invested now in training of teachers and building capacity from a technological perspective, we should be able to ensure that students do not experience a full disruption of the learning in the future, but rather can easily transition from face-to-face -to, -face to continued online learning given the experiences that we would have learned from the COVID experience now. Thanks for that, Roderick. And, and, and the whole question of leaving no one behind, uh, which is a part of the, the big agenda of the SDG4 educational agenda uh, 2030, as well as the CARICOM Human Resource Development Strategy, 
if we are going to really work on leaving no one behind, we have to really think about the ways in which we are moving together, not just for our students and with our students, but with our teachers as well, because we can't leave our teachers behind in the technology development. So I'll go to the next question that we have here. And um, I'll read what the, the, the person shared there. And, and we saw in a very practical way, the question of leaving no one behind and the implications. There was a message in the chat from one of our participants who had to leave because she was participating in the session, but her daughter had to do an online examination. And therefore they had bad, I don't know if everybody saw that, but that for me was like a ripe example of what we're confronting across the world and in particular the Caribbean with this reality. And therefore that has implications for the ways in which we make sense of how we do learning and how we experience learning. So the next question, there is some anecdotal evidence emerging that some students are actually doing better in the distance learning environment than they were doing in school, for example, by reporting increased emotional self-regulation, resilience, and self-facing, willingness to share responsibilities, and limited resources within the home environment, and so on. So the question, what implications do you think this might have for the way education is delivered once schools reopen? Is COVID-19 a silver lining? So jump in, whoever wants to take it. You don't need permission, just jump right in. Yeah, go ahead, Carlos. Thank you, thank you, Lorette. Uh, I think it's a very good question, and I think it is, it's got a silver lining indeed. Uh, every, every crisis is an opportunity to rethink the way we do things, uh, but also every crisis reveals how it affects people differently. So the issue of equity and inclusion that you raised, I think is fundamental. Uh, on the one hand, there are certain groups that are more vulnerable and which have less resources that we've talked about, but also that have different abilities. That's the, 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 the case of people with uh, disabilities or uh, rurality or the different issues uh, of community disadvantage that people face. So certainly there will be some arrested development and some uh, learning gaps that will probably derive from this, from this uh, condition in, 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 in this sector of the population. But it also has this, this silver lining that you were talking about, which is how, what lessons do we extract and how do certain competencies and skills are strengthened? That is particularly the case of autonomous learning, self-direction, agency. And I think uh, this idea of opening up the concept of and the idea of education and schooling and, and, and debating and, and, and putting into dialogue when we prioritize the curriculum, what are the skills and what are the competencies that are really the most important? And, and as, as was said before, that, help, that can help us in the face of other uh, disasters like, like natural disasters that are rather common in, in the Caribbean. So I would say that, that it is a good opportunity to, to open up the idea of lifelong and life-wide learning, other learning spaces, other learning environments, other content, things that are very valuable that one can learn outside the school, but that remains educational. If I can come in here, Laurette. Um... The, this, uh, there's a great opportunity being provided for us now through this experience for a particular group of, or group of students across all education systems. And we have not mentioned it so far this morning. For those students who have special needs, whether it be physical challenges in one way or another, learning needs, the, the improvement in technologies at this point in time have created an, or the advancement in technology has now created an excellent opportunity whereby we can reach more students, especially those who have varying special needs or learning challenges or physical challenges through the use of the technology. So yes, there will be those students who may benefit more from a face-to-face -face environment. There are those who may thrive more in an online environment because of different learning needs, different learning styles, using multiple intelligences, 
but one category that we must zero in on to ensure that we can provide improved access through the use of the technologies will be those students who have various learning challenges that we can cater better to their individual needs. I think this, uh, there's an excellent opportunity from that uh, point, point of view. Thanks for that. And I'm going to move us quickly along and I'm going to take two last questions. We can't get to all the questions and you'd notice that time flies when we're having fun. So I'm going to share the two questions. And because I'm, those of you who know me, I am pretty mischievous. So I'm going to end on two potentially contentious questions for us to consider within this reality. One is the question of increased screen time that our children are now spending on computers, laptops, um, phones, et cetera. And we were getting a lot of research and data that was telling us about how dangerous and destructive uh, the, the amount of overuse on the screen time is. And here we are in a reality where we are upping the screen time for our students. So what are the implications for this? How do we do a balance, you to borrow from Peter, a pragma, how do we engage in pragmatic solutions to this reality? And it speaks to the whole question of arrested development versus silver lining opportunities as well. So how are we managing that? And, and what advice do we want to give to parents and to teachers around helping and making sure that we have a balanced approach to screen time? The other question really is a, is a question of resetting the process so that uh, we, what then do we need to do for in spaces where the response has not necessarily been as systematic as we would like it? What do we need to do to reset the process? And I don't know if we can reset it, which is why I'm thinking that we, it's a contentious question. Reset the process for it to be the most effective after in some cases we might have had systematically have haphazard responses so we want to wrap up with those two questions and i want to give every member of the panel to take a tack at that and any last thoughts you want to leave the audience with i wouldn't mind going first Lorette. i can i can safely say in my presentation uh, which i i did have to rush through quite a bit um the whole matter of the imposition of screen time limits uh, would have been identified in my presentation in Barbados. We had significant discussion with regard to that and we felt very strongly that, and we didn't actually consider the issuing of protocols regarding the limits of times for students according to age groups. But however, the maximum screen time for any student at any one point in time would have been between 20 to 30 minutes. For younger children, it would have been 15 minutes of screen time maximum in any one synchronous session with teachers. And therefore, it is important that we provide that opportunity for parents and students to recognize that, that the, the continuous engagement on the computer or the device presents a health risk as well. And therefore, we have to strike that balance between facilitating the learning and development that is required against the health risks that um, are potentially are there through excessive screen time. And in Barbados, we have taken that very seriously and we've given consideration to limiting screen time um, for students according to age groups, but for sure not exceeding um, 30 minutes at any one point in time. Lawrence, I, I, I wanted to, to touch on not screen time necessarily. Um, with regard to screen time, one of the, the, the thing that I would say is um, people always talk about students being on their phones all the time, young people being on their phones all the time, and that's, that's a lot of screen time. And um, I think I would want to, to leave it to the experts to talk about that. But I also want to talk about the screen time for, for teachers and, and other stuff, because within this, this COVID environment, we found, I think everybody has found that the work has increased in terms of the number of meetings that you would have. And therefore, going forward, so I really want to deal with the going forward. I think we really need to reconfigure what the education system is going to be in the Caribbean. 
And I think we need a, a full-on systemic approach with learning at the center. Because sometimes I feel we do things without really recognizing what is important for the learner. For example, we rushed, many countries rushed territories within the region, rushed to make sure schooling continued through a virtual environment, as opposed to rushing to ensure learning continued in its very powerful and simplistic forms. I, I, I was lucky to, to um, see a young, a young lady preschooler every day engaged in activities of learning and that would impact her life for the rest of her life and learning real skills. She was baking and she was being questioned about the ingredients and, and the um, measures, how she's measuring. So she's learning maths, she's learning science. Why are you putting, beating the milk, the butter and the sugar together in very basic, simplistic forms? And Caribbean people have always learned through the spoken word. And there's a sense in which we must recognize that that spoken word doesn't only have to be face-to-face. -face. We can transition it into the virtual environment. And it's a powerful way of learning and imparting, I, I don't want to use the term imparting knowledge, but in, we see that as a thing in the Caribbean, an important indigenous way of learning. And when um, the COVID crisis hit, Many people seem to have forgotten that and felt we had to rush to the online platform. And I really feel we need to use the online platforms and to use the technology. But people have to know what they are doing. So we can't move the face-to-face -face system with all its issues and problems into an online form. That is what, that's all we would, we would get, moving the problems from one place to the next. So I think what we really need to do is for territories to look at learning, what we mean, really mean by learning at all the levels, from preschool to tertiary, and then determine strategies to take us forward in this 21st century and, and to use technology. I, I don't see us going back to just doing face-to-face -face alone in any, at any level. And, I, and I'm glad for that, to be honest, because I feel that at all levels, the your person should be exposed to using tech to technology and engaging in work education through technology. Look at what is happening here today. We are all contributing from right in our homes. And this is powerful. The messages we need to go out are in fact going out. But we need to engage more with some of our indigenous means of learning and focus on learning, not just teaching, but focus on empowering teachers to inspire learners and empower those learners. The way in which we could do it is to empower them. And, and it has to then be active learning. That's, that's all I have to say. Um, I was just going to mention um, in terms of the the issues of uh, like screen time and and the also like these issues of of the reset, um, just to um, to bring it back to the teacher task force. So in terms of the the knowledge platform that we've designed and created, um, we intend this and, and and we're building it to be sort of a, a one place uh, one one stop shopping center for. Uh, maybe you know information or expertise or knowledge or guidelines or uh, literature about uh, all these types of topics related to teaching and learning, uh, focusing on the on the teacher. So again, um, uh, not to not that I have an answer per se for any of those questions, but um, but the teacher task force and the knowledge platform will be a key instrument uh, in that regard. In terms of the reset, the teacher task force is also working on uh, a policy brief in terms of the return to schools. Uh, which uh, should be anticipated uh, in within a short period of time. So uh, I would just like to underline uh, that for, for going forward, which will be uh, be available for download at some point soon. That's fantastic. Thanks, Peter. 
Yes. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, just a, just a, a final thought on the on the issue of uh, not necessarily the screen time, but it does apply to it. But but the issue of uh, this uh, global pandemic has has instilled this source and and, and this kind of uh, of rush to to continue learning and to don't let it fall and 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 like like learning is a process that happens fast and it never has been so it's very important to consider uh, again that learning is a lifelong process and that education and, and and learning take place in a continuum and it's a slow process i mean many many i mean often we we complain about the lack of time to prepare classes to prepare lessons to prepare resources to let things sink in in, for, for reflection with learners or actually to do other things that the prescribed curriculum does not necessarily include or give enough time to. So in that respect, uh, the idea of resetting is actually a good one when we can think of other uh, learning and development dimensions of the human personality that are, usu that are usually sidelined from formal education and this could be an opportunity to bring in other forms of learning, as I said before, other learning spaces. Uh, and, and to remember, uh, in a previous uh, webinar, one of our speakers said that, that one cannot learn to run in a swimming pool. You cannot run in a swimming pool. They're not made for running. I think we can, say, we can take the same to say that uh, the same happens with education. It is a slow process. It takes time. And, and, and we have the time to do it now. We should have the resources to make use of that time. Thanks for that, Carlos. And the last word to Mark, and I hope that your audio supports you. I hope so too. A clear case of uh, poor internet connectivity. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to just support what my colleagues could have mentioned um, already on. That this pandemic generally has taken us by some level of the time and uh, being unprepared, so to speak, um, for its full impact. And in that way, we have rushed, we have uh, been forced to implement some form of learning to impact um, our learners within the, their homes or wherever they are. And that in itself has not been fully thought out at all how it can impact them negatively. And so there, there is need for a collaborative approach to so, um, use the impact the screen time is going to have on both teachers and I think Dr. James would have mentioned it, how it's going to have an impact on teachers as well as learners. Um, so that has to be thought out. And I'm not a medical person, so I can't say how that will, but I know we have to sit together and come up with a common uh, position as to how we go forward. I agree that this pandemic is going to provide the kind of um, silver lining for many countries to see that, that we need to we need to adapt and we need to implement and embrace face-to-face um, -face as well as online um, modes of implementing our curriculum. That will go a far way in developing the Thank you. Thanks to that, uh, Mark, and thanks to that, our panelists. Very good. Uh, we are all celebrating and appreciating uh, the responses and the engagement that we have engaged, uh, had this morning. Um, just to kind of remind us of some key points that we want to take away with us from this session. Um, the need for pragmatic solutions, the need for thoughtful, systemic, collaborative action, the need to clearly articulate what is required of teachers in a coordinated approach and response, the need to continue and maintain and support social dialogue and networking, recognizing that we are going to continually be engaged in the dilemma between arrested development and the silver lining. 
and very importantly as well, the need for a mind shift in terms of how we conceive our education systems and the way in which we conceive of issues related to learning. But when we think about some other measured responses that we'll take away, we really need to ensure that we have a comprehensive system-wide support for teachers and educational, provision, and educational policy as it relates to policy provision, professional support, continued monitoring, the status of teachers and the conditions of their employment and so forth. We want to ensure that the COVID pandemic becomes an opportunity to relook at teaching and learning practices in particular, considering the fact that teachers and educational personnel were not well prepared to tackle their work in a particular, as it relates to distance education. And finally, another takeaway point, teachers and education personnel are frontline workers, which is why we started with the role of teaching. And going forward, uh, particularly related to the opening of schools, we must ensure that their health mental and emotional well-being so that they are well supported and confident to go back to teaching and managing schools which in turn impacts on that of children and young people so colleagues thank you very much participants thank you very much just a few bits of house cleaning i'm watching the chat and i'm seeing the need for further conversation about these matters and i will tell you keep your eyes out we are going to be running a number of other um, webinars to deal with and to dive even deeper into some of the issues that we are facing here the next one that's coming is going to be related to the reopening of schools and the implications of that and how should we really think about reopening schools. So that's the next one on the agenda. And I want to say thank you so much. We had a fantastic run at the maximum. We had 300, we had 368 persons, but we had 560 persons registered. So we know that they're not here with us, not because they don't want to be, they're not here with us because the connectivity issue may have been a challenge. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to our colleagues uh, from the UNESCO Santiago office and the UNESCO Kingston office, to Fariel and her team. And of course, Yayoi, Carolina, Langshi, and Paula from the UNESCO Santiago office who have been helping me keep my eyes on things as we go about the place. So thank you, everybody, and have a blessed rest of the week and a fantastic day. It was great having you here with us. Let me just say... The recording will be put up on the UNESCO um, website and we will send that information out to you. And as it relates to the presentations, you would see it as a part of the recording. So thanks everybody. And you can share that. The more we share information, the more we are able to respond more appropriately. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Laurette. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Bye.